Welcome to the Podcast Coins. I'm your host, Patrick McLean, and I'll be joined by a panel of experts. Happy to be here with Dave Jevons, Nathaniel Popper. I'm Asif Herji. Paolo Arduino. Sitting here today with Eric Voorhees. I get to sit here today with Charles Hodgkinson. My name is Bill Barheit. So I'm sitting here today with Kosala Himachandra. Here today with Roger Vare. I'm Sam Bankman Fried. I'm the uh, co founder and CEO of FTX. And on this episode, we will discuss what are becoming the new banks, meaning Bitcoin exchanges, and how the first one had a meteoric rise that came crashing down and almost took Bitcoin with it. The FBI's takedown of the Silk Road and the ensuing publicity surrounding its association with Bitcoin left our crypto hero bloodied and wobbly. But as Sylvester Stallone's character Rocky Balboa says in the classic boxing movie Rocky, in the boxing ring of life, it's not how hard you get hit, but how many times you can get hit and keep moving forward. Bitcoin would have little time to recover from the Silk Road flurry of ferocious uppercuts, and things had to keep moving forward. Who then would have known that our hero would soon be walking into a second metaphorical wave of punches? A lethal combination that would leave it on the verge of being counted out of the fight. In this episode, we'll explain how Mount Gox and an acronym for a company called Magic the Gathering Online Exchange, one of the earliest and biggest cryptocurrency exchanges in the world for buying Bitcoin, was hacked and then robbed in broad daylight. The story of Mt. Gox is uh, an important one. At its peak, the company handled between 70 and 80% of all Bitcoin transactions worldwide and helped put the fledging cryptocurrency on the map. So it would make sense that if Mt. Gox found itself compromised in any way, it would have a great effect on its dependent Bitcoin partner. And that's exactly what happened. In 2014, it was discovered that some 850,000 Bitcoins were missing from the Mt. Gox coffers. Today, those digital coins would be valued at over $50 billion. The theft from a seemingly legitimate company operating within the confines of the law shook the confidence of Bitcoin investors and customers around the world yet again. The chaos and uncertainty that followed the biggest heist in the history of the planet almost delivered the knockout blow to Bitcoin's reputation as the Rocky Balboa of the cryptosphere. But what doesn't kill us only makes us stronger. Since this epic cyber theft of Mt. Gox was discovered, some 200,000 stolen Bitcoins have been recovered. But there are still almost as many unanswered questions surrounding the theft as there are missing Bitcoins. What exactly happened at Mt. Gox? Still, to this day, no one can be sure. Do you mind explaining in as most simple terms as you can, what is a centralized exchange? So a centralized exchange is a um, say website, to put in simple terms, which customers can uh, deposit uh, money like fiat, like dollars, euros, um, British pounds, yen, and so on, and buy Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies or sell uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies back into fiat. Um, so this is in a simple terms what an exchange is. A centralized exchange or an exchange in general is a place where users can buy or sell um, goods in our case is cryptocurrencies. In general, is uh, can be any type of assets like equities, like uh, you know bonds, like um, shares of funds and uh, derivatives. Basically, a centralized exchange is like your bank account for crypto. So it's similar to using any of the banking services available, just instead of uh, for cash and like dollars, USD, like euros or whatever. You use this centralized service to store. Ethereum, Bitcoin, and all these other cryptocurrencies. It's very similar to uh, logging into an account, just like username and password, and they will take care of everything else for you. And if the government had said exchanges, you can't take dollars and give people Bitcoin, um, the exchanges would have had to stop operating. That's, that's what happened in China in 2013. In 2013, Bitcoin took off in late 2013 because in Asia, particularly China, uh, people went nuts for Bitcoin and all the banks would transfer your money to a Bitcoin exchange in China and people would buy it. And the government in late 2012 said, 
banks, Chinese banks, you can't do this anymore. And it stopped. And the price of Bitcoin crashed. And if every government, every other government in the world had done that, um, I think it, it, it would have at least set Bitcoin's progress back by many, many years, um, if not sort of stopped it in its tracks. Crypto exchanges are interesting. They're way, way more central to crypto than NYSE or CMER, traditional finance. And the reason for that is that they're more than just a matching engine, right? When you think about if you, as a retail trader, go to buy Apple stock, you don't go log on to NYSE.com, right? You, you, you open up E-Trade or Robinhood, some sort of GUI front end, um, create an account there, try and buy a stock, they pass it off to some, you know, payment for order flow HFT firm, which then pass it off to some technology firms. It goes through some custodians and clearing firms in the middle. It ends up um, on, on, you know, on some exchange and then goes through that same process on the back end. There's like 10 companies involved from start to finish there. You know, if you sort of look at everyone who's involved in that single trade happening, if you look in crypto, there's only three the buyer, the seller, and the exchange. The exchange, it's, I mean, it's the, the matching engine, it's the risk engine, the liquidation bot, it's the clearing firm, it's the custodian, it's a retail GUI, it's the institutional API connection, it's the website, it's the brand, it's the customer acquisition tool, it's a product design, all of that rolled up into one product. And that's what you see when you, you get Coinbase or FTX or Binance or, or any of the other top exchanges is that, you know, they really are, more than half of the total operational infrastructure in crypto. Um, so they're really, really important in crypto. Tell us a little bit about, firstly, I'd like you to start with the role of Coinbase in crypto history, particularly here in, in the United States, uh, and then also leading through that, that auspicious or inauspicious time period. Yeah, I, I think it was more auspicious than not. The, um, so so I, I view Coinbase as, as the, the on-ramp for the layperson into crypto. It's, its whole role, and, and you know, credit, credit Brian uh, and Fred for doing that, the founders, is they positioned, crypt, uh, they positioned Coinbase as the simple, safe way to buy crypto, and specifically when they started Bitcoin. Right? And it, it's, hard to, it's hard to remember now maybe, but you know, back in you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, trying to buy Bitcoin was sketchy. Right? You went to these kind of anonymous sites and you, you had these enormously long character strings that you had to put in and you had to store it yourself on your hard drive. Or it, not the most user-friendly experience. And so part of the magic of, of, of Coinbase was that it made it much simpler. Okay? And it, I think you know, there's people who argue that, oh, it, it, it goes against the ethos of, of, of crypto because it's a centralized solution. But the fact is it brought millions of people into crypto who would otherwise not have done so, okay? We wouldn't get the adoption of Bitcoin today without the Coinbases of this world doing what they did. What is a decentralized exchange? A decentralized exchange is kind of similar to the functions that a centralized exchange does. But the difference there is that um, the the decentralized exchange, especially in the way we know it today, or the most common form of a decentralized exchange, is using blockchain to run. So a centralized exchange is a piece of software that is separate from blockchain, runs in an um, infrastructure that is uh, on AWS, so Amazon, Google Cloud, or in any data center in the world, while a decentralized exchange instead runs the, its entirety of operations on a blockchain as a smart contract. There are two uh, main functions of a decentralized exchange. One is to be more transparent and the other one is to uh, leave to the customers the custody of their funds. And uh, those both are extremely interesting features. Today, all of the Bitcoin exchanges are centralized. Um, there aren't really decentralized Bitcoin exchanges today, at least not any that operate with any significant scale. Um, that will change pretty soon through some projects that I, I won't mention here. But um, decentralized 
exchange will come to Bitcoin soon, and it's already been existing within the Ethereum ecosystem uh, for a long time. This means that people will be able to trade uh, freely with each other in a decentralized way. It means that people will be able to earn an interest rate in a decentralized way without having any custodian or any intermediary that can block your transaction or prevent you from accessing those markets. So the, the point of all this is just that they are extremely, they're extremely equitable. Do you mind kind of running through a variety of, of custody options, both that are held by someone else and then custody that, that you're also holding? Yeah. So the issue of custody is really important if you're going to be involved in cryptocurrency at all. And it's something that is entirely new and different from how the normal banking world works. So most people are used to their banks or their financial institutions. And if you have money, it's held in your bank. If you own stocks, they're held at some brokerage. Bitcoin comes around and you can actually hold the Bitcoins yourself. So there's no one that's holding it for you. You, you have a private key secured somehow, and you are the only one with access and control to that private key. This is what's known as um, controlling your own keys or, or self custody. This is the proper way of holding cryptocurrency. Um, now, because you can do that doesn't mean that you have to. There are services which will hold your crypto for you, similar to how a bank holds your money for you. And it's okay to use those systems, but you need to understand why that's different and what the trade-offs are. So, you know, everyone has heard of Coinbase at this point. Coinbase is custodial, which means that they hold users' funds. So they operate much like a bank does in that you have to trust them. They are a very trustworthy company, but you still have to trust that, them as a third party. A lot of people will buy Bitcoin and it's held at Coinbase and they never realize that that's not the way to use this stuff. The way to use it is to hold it on your own keys. And the reason that's important is because the, the most critical essence, the, the essential property of Bitcoin is that you have sovereignty over it, which means you have full control with no one's permission required to use it. That property only exists on the Bitcoin that you're holding yourself on your own keys. If you need Coinbase's permission to withdraw or to send or to interact with your money, um, that's no different, better or worse than a, than a bank. If you have your Bitcoin on your own keys, you then achieve the full self-sovereignty over your value and over your money. So it's really important to understand that. The trade-off here is that you have to use it securely. If you lose that key, and you haven't made a backup, your money is gone. Um, if you encrypt it and you forget your password, that money is gone. So it takes a little bit of personal responsibility, but just like anything in life, like driving a car, right? That's an important task that all of us need to know how to do responsibly, and everyone takes some time to learn how to drive a car. You should take some time to learn how to self-custody Bitcoin. It's not that hard, but it requires a little bit of effort. And once you do it, then you can actually achieve the real purpose of all this stuff, which is true sovereignty over your money, and no one in the world can take it away from you. Will that choice be heavily directed by people kind of looking at it as convenience over like privacy and ownership? Yeah, convenience, privacy, ownership, and then just the security model are all, are all relevant here. Um, it may be more convenient to hold some Bitcoin with a custodian so that when you need to sell it, you can sell it easily and then the money goes to your bank account, right? That's understandable. Um, but it's less secure and you're trusting that party. So you're making a, a trade-off and you need to be making a conscious decision if you're doing that. Most people don't have all of their Bitcoin in a custodian or self-custody. They have some kind of mix. And the important thing isn't to do all or one or the other. It's just to understand the trade-offs and to know how to use those trade-offs well. You mentioned Mt. Gox. Can we kind of pull back there and just give the, the listeners or the viewers a um, you know, mini understanding of what that story was? Yeah, so the, the world's, one of the world's first cryptocurrency exchanges, and back then actually, they were just called Bitcoin exchanges. There were no other cryptocurrencies. There was Bitcoin and that, that was it. It was a company called Mt. Gox, and that was an acronym for the original website, stood for Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. And the guy that started it, he had been interested in magic, and I actually played Magic the Gathering as a young man as well. So just another interesting overlap of how the early Bitcoin community had such similar worldviews. But uh, they launched this website called Mt. Gox that allowed people to buy or sell Bitcoin for their dollars and later euros and, and pounds and other currencies out there. 
but just through strange chance, the headquarters for Mt. Gox was walking distance from where I was living in Tokyo. I could literally see the Mt. Gox office building out of the window of my apartment. That's how close it was. And uh, they enabled people to be able to buy and sell Bitcoin all over the world. And it became more and more popular and became a, you know, a bigger and bigger deal. But it turned out later on that they were running, they had been hacked and they had lost a huge amount of the people's Bitcoins. And they were running a fractional reserve Bitcoin platform there. And it wasn't until much later when people finally figured out that it was a fractional reserve system, the entire thing came crashing down and people lost a huge, huge, huge amount of Bitcoin, huge amount of money because of that. And I think that that's another powerful example of why it's so important for people to be able to hold the cryptocurrencies themselves on their own device and not have to use custodial platforms. And I want to switch to a, another one of the major institutions uh, of the early Bitcoin space that you mentioned in your TED talk, that of course of Mt. Gox which at the time, in 2012, fairly reasonably, you suggested, you know, if users don't want to download the full, you know, Bitcoin Core, they can, they can just, you know, go on Mt. Gox and, and do their exchanges there. Tell us a little bit about, again, what that institution means, what its legacy was, a bit of the story. Sure. So, so there are effectively two ways to get Bitcoin, right? The first is you earn it online by effectively mining. Mining is a way to basically earn Bitcoin. Effectively, you're playing a game using your computing power against other people. Now, in the early days of Bitcoin, for at least a few months, you could actually do that with a laptop. I did. I actually won Bitcoin, lots of Bitcoin, most of which I gave away because it wasn't worth anything at the time, uh, by just using like a, a MacBook or, or, or some PC notebook. I actually was able to get the software to run on Linux. Or, or in addition to mining or winning the Bitcoin, you could go to somebody else who would send you the Bitcoin in exchange for you getting them money somehow, right? And there was ways to do that peer to peer, like you could use in the United States something even like a Craigslist to say, oh, I'm selling Bitcoin. Because nobody really thought about, oh, selling Bitcoin is equivalent to like a Western Union business, like it's a regulated money service business. Nobody even thought of that. Bitcoin was more like a product, like, you would, like a Beanie Baby, a, a collectible you might sell on eBay, right? So, so but, the, but then the other thing you could do to sell it was use a central marketplace. Now today, there's lots of exchanges, right? I, I run a trading app that lets you buy and sell Bitcoin. But in the earliest days, th there were none. So somebody had this brilliant idea, right? In, in, I think they were based in Japan, that, that they would create this new, new marketplace that would let people say, here's how much Bitcoin I'm willing to sell. Here's what I'm willing to sell it for. Somebody else would say, here's how much Bitcoin I want to buy. Here's how much I'm willing to pay for it. And it would match them together. We call that an order book. So this order book would take sellers, buyers, match them, and they would, the buyer would have their Bitcoin, the seller would have their money, just like any other marketplace. And this was brilliant because it, mean, it meant anybody in the world could now get access to Bitcoin in exchange for their government fiat money instantly. Right? The challenge was in the implementation of this Mt. Gox website, it was not built in a very secure way. And that led, unfortunately, to a series of hacks, which actually led to the demise of Mt. Gox and the theft of pretty much all of the Bitcoin that hadn't been withdrawn. Unfortunately, an exchange, or this order book as I described it, is a trusted third party, right? Bitcoin itself is trying to eliminate trusted third parties. But how do you go from the existing monetary system to Bitcoin? You need on-ramps and off-ramps, meaning I need a way to get into Bitcoin and get out of my old money. Well, you need some type of trusted third party to do that. Or worst case, you meet somebody in person, you hand them cash and they hand you the Bitcoin. But that's not a very scalable solution. So the marketplace or the exchange is meant to be a scalable solution to do that. The challenge is we're now trusting these exchanges like Mt. Gox. And, and, and if they're not implemented correctly, you end up with the failure of Mt. Gox. What was the issue with Mt. Gox? So there was a, a hack, right? And, and, and what was this devastating to Bitcoin? And was this another moment that things could have gone very wrong? Yeah, I mean, there was a very slow motion hack of, of Mt. Gox. I think, God, it was so complicated and convoluted, the, the cause for it, that I still almost can't get it all straight in my head. But I, um, but essentially, Bitcoin were slowly being drained out of Mt. Gox. And Mark Carpellis, this guy in Tokyo who was running Mt. Gox, 
was aware of it, but was trying to kind of plug the holes. And, you know, it was one of these situations where he's like sticking a finger in over here and they're coming out over here and then he sticks a finger in over here. And at some point it just, he, he just realized that basically all the Bitcoins were gone. And I remember thinking this, this might be the end of Bitcoin. This, this, this could do it. And I think a lot of people felt that way at that point, you know, you had something like, God, what was it, you know, eight, 700,000 Bitcoins that were just gone and nobody knew where they were and all these people who bought them and thought they had Bitcoins, you know, their, that money was gone. And, you know, it did raise questions about Bitcoin. I mean, of course, of course, there was an immediately an argument that, that Bitcoin hadn't broken, you know, the Bitcoin software kept working. It was just this guy in Tokyo, what he had built stopped working. How detrimental was it to Bitcoin? I mean, even in establishing a, like an, a, pri a price. Uh, so Mt. Gox was hacked a number of different times over the years. I, I think the first hack was in two, or the first public hack was in 2011. And at that point, it was the only Bitcoin exchange in the entire world. And so Mt. Gox was offline for maybe about a week. And basically the Bitcoin economy kind of ground to a halt because nobody knew what the price of Bitcoin was. There was, when Mt. Gox went offline, I think the price was like $15, but had the price moved down to 10, had it gone up to 20, nobody knew. And so all of this commerce that was happening on Bitcoin kind of ground to a halt and we needed some sort of price discovery mechanism for Bitcoin to, to, to turn back on again. And then a week later when, when Bitcoin, oh, I'm sorry, when, when Mt. Gox relaunched, people could figure out what the correct price for Bitcoin was again. And then the commerce and, and the transactions started taking place on, uh, on Bitcoin again, but without Mt. Gox in the early days, there wasn't really a way to set a price for Bitcoin. And without that price being settable, there wasn't really a way to use Bitcoin in commerce. So it was a, a really, really, really important part of the ecosystem in the early days there. That was not an isolated problem. You know, in those, in those years of Bitcoin, every exchange would get hacked. And that was just part of Bitcoin. And it, and it showed a weakness of Bitcoin. You know, you, yes, the Bitcoin software worked, but the Bitcoin software was too complicated for most people to use. And so they would use these wallets created by these exchanges and they would store their Bitcoin there. And it was because it was so hard to use the basic Bitcoin software that they would go to the exchange. And so in some ways, the kind of basic intent of Bitcoin, which was to you know move to a world where you didn't have financial institutions, it, you know, it had fallen flat. People were just using financial institutions. They were just using new, worse financial institutions than the old financial institutions. They were using Mt. Gox instead of Bank America. And trust me, you would rather have your money at Bank of America than at Mt. Gox. And that was, you know, what Bitcoin was at that point. And in some ways, that's still what it is. You just have new Bank of America. You have Coinbase now where your money sits. And most people are not using Bitcoin in the way that it was envisioned, which was you know, a way to hold your money and be your own bank. You know, there are people who do that. There are definitely committed people who do that. And you can do that. And that's significant. But, you know, most people are, are just holding their Bitcoins at these in central Bitcoin institutions. And Mt. Gox was the first big one of those. And those central Bitcoin institutions are, you know, they're honeypots. They're the place that hackers want to go. And hackers have managed to get into most of them. Do you have any stories of, of like one or two attempts uh, that you can talk about that, that you think are the most interesting and, and wowed you how like, innovative their, their plan was? Um, yes, that's definitely one. Because basically a group of people broke the internet to attack my ETH wallet. Basically what happened, uh, you have to understand, internet is mm, built on very, very old technology. And we are, everyone is hoping that everything will work flawlessly in order for internet to work. And it's, it's basically based on reputation. So uh, if one point in, in that rep reputation circle fail, the whole thing can fail. At that point in time, these people were able to um, get access to one of the internet providers. I think they, he, the provider was based in Oregon and send a malicious, malicious message saying, my wallet no longer exists with Amazon. That's where the my wallet was hosted. It does not no longer exist with Amazon. It exists in Russia data center. In order for it to work, they had to send 
a large enough message so it does not only um, attack my Ether wallet, it attacks a group of like a huge set of websites. Because of that, some of the major Amazon, like uh, websites hosted in Amazon went down during this period of time, which was like two hours. And everyone, like literally the whole world was trying to figure out like what's happening. And I was, I woke up middle of the night, like, cause I got a call for saying, uh, okay, like my Ether wallet is take, trying to take you to a different website and there's a SSL error and all this, and I woke up trying to figure out where, what's wrong, because like, I looked at my setup, like everything is perfectly fine, no problems, like from our end, within like hours, security experts on DNS started uh, tweeting saying, okay, it looks like something's wrong with like Amazon DNS, looks like it's sending people to like different servers outside of uh, US and all that, and it took a while for them to figure out like actually who, what, what, which site was the, the targeted site mm. and turned out to be myetherwallet.com. Um, fortunately for our users, they did not do it properly. Did that terrify you? Of course, like I was trying to figure out like that two hours was like, in, like insanely scary, like trying to figure out what's happening because I have to know the problem in order to fix it. And after that happened, like a lot of security experts, like DNS, especially like specialized in DNS actually reached out to me. Cloudflare was one of them. Um, and they actually did a report on it. And it was also covered by Forbes, if I'm not mistaken. It was big. I mean, that's how far these malicious actors will go. Was the assumption that it was a state sponsored actor? Not sure, but some, whoever did it has to have a lot of money in order to accomplish that attack because it's not easy to support because we are not talking about just one website. We're talking about like 100 and or like uh, last time I think it was like 100 to 150 different websites and that much traffic going into your server, it's, it's, it's a regular server cannot handle it. Right. So whoever did that had to have a lot of money to pull that off. I think essentially that narrative is gonna get hacked was correct. I mean, that's what happened to most people who own Bitcoins early on. They lost their Bitcoins in some exchange theft. And, you know, again, drugs were an important part of the early commerce in Bitcoin. When the Silk Road died, it was quickly replaced by new alternatives. And um, I think Bitcoin people don't like it that that was what defined Bitcoin early on. But I think that did define Bitcoin early on. And, and in some ways, what I, what's most interesting about those years in 2013 and 2014 is that it wasn't entirely outlawed because it could have been. And, and I think, again, this is somewhere where Bitcoin purists like to think, oh, sure, the government could have outlawed it, but you know, the, the, the network would have kept working and, and Bitcoin would have stayed alive. And, you know, there's a degree to which that's true. But if you couldn't go to an exchange and buy a Bitcoin, there would be a very, very small audience of people who are going to go to the trouble of, 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 you know, buying Bitcoin on the street or, you know, doing a, a, an exchange online with somebody who you couldn't trust. I mean, it was exchanges that made it possible for, for, for a broader crowd of people to access this. And then when Mt. Gox collapsed, that was a philosophical moment for the ecosystem because a lot of the core developers of Bitcoin, the custodians of Bitcoin, had their money on Mt. Gox. So it would have been very easy for them to say, well, this is a catastrophic event. Let's have a bailout. Let's reverse the transaction so we get our money back. They didn't do it. They took a loss. In some cases, millions of dollars of money just gone. And a lot of these guys were poor before they went to Bitcoin. So this is all they had. And they'd spent years of their lives working on the protocol and they'd amassed all this fortune. They left coins there and they're taking like a 50%, 60%, 70% net wealth hit uh, from one event. And they could have easily reversed it. They wouldn't do it. They said it would compromise the integrity of the system. It would compromise the integrity of Bitcoin. So that to me said, okay, the philosophy is here to stay. Code is law. These guys are not going to change. This protocol does not change for anybody. This is the only event where you can kind of get a do-over if you want to, and they didn't take the do-over. So that was a test that the US financial system went to in 2008. And what happened? We failed the test. Too big to fail, they got bigger. Bailout, bailout, bailout. 
the uh, quantitative easing never ended. The national debt is now like $25 trillion. It's a crazy number. You know, it keeps growing. When uh, Bill Clinton left office, it was $4.5 trillion. Look how quickly that number went up. Uh, and then they just lie. They say, oh, well, you know, uh, inflation is uh, 2%, 3%. And the price of timber is up 117% this year. You know, so there's an implicit dishonesty in the legacy system. But in the crypto system, no matter if it gets hit or has a failure or a crisis or an event or something happens that's inconvenient to an individual or a company, we just deal with it and we move on. But the integrity of the system, the philosophy of the system is maintained. It's preserved and it just keeps going. Let's talk about how you help the victims. So how do you help people in recovery situations or other circumstances? Yeah, so one of the things I think about Cypher Trace is that we like to help the community and it's about people. So every day we get people who communicate with us, which is, you know, my crypto got stolen. I, um, I got fished and they hacked my credentials and stole my crypto. Um, I fell for a romance scam, you know, I felt this person, I was in love with them and they needed money to pay for their travel or their passport or start a business, you know, these romance scams. Oh, I saw Elon Musk was offering on Twitter to double my Bitcoin if I sent him money. So I sent him, you know, $100,000 and I never got anything back because it wasn't really Elon Musk. And so it really makes it personal for us where we get probably half a dozen maybe a day of these coming in, which are people who are in desperate need that need help. And so what we've done at Cypher Trace is, you know, we, we try to help these people, but there's too much of it for us. So what we did was we worked with a dozen different universities around the world uh, to basically enable their graduate students who are in uh, computer security or financial crimes investigation studies to give them Cypher Trace tools to train them, and then we give them these cases. So we help connect them to the victims so that they can then work on those cases, talk to them, understand their situation, get the color around the case, get the emails about it and all that stuff, and then try to help them get their money back. And in many cases, it's important, you know, because some people lost five or $10,000, but some people lost 50,000 or 100,000, and it's meaningful. Like It might be 50 or 100% of a person's life savings, it might be their rent. So we really think that providing that community service where we're helping bring investigators into the fold, connecting them with victims, enabling that whole thing so that people can get some help, I think that's important for us. Got it. And, and just to go through that a little more, if you were to say blockchain, uh, would you say that it's just a long list of every transaction, but you can't really see who it went to and from, and, and you guys are then going and connecting those dots? Sure, that's a simple way to think about it. As much as you can say, what are, what are, what are, how do you guys bind some of that? If, if no one knows uh, who's sending anything, how do you uncover it? Many different ways. So um, sometimes, so we don't try to, at Cybertrace, we don't try to find out the name and address of an individual. We're not interested in that and that's your business. What we try to do is help companies solve the problem of, am I receiving, for example, stolen funds, should I freeze it? And then help the victim say, oh, I got the stuff stolen, oh, it landed over here, can I recover my funds? Simple example, right? So we don't have to know who is the name and address of the person that stole your stuff, we just need to know where they deposited it so that we can put a freeze request on it and you can help, you know, hopefully go get your money back. So there's that. So figuring out who are all these exchanges around the world, which addresses do they control across different currencies. Then the next one is digging down into who are the bad guys. So who are the ransomware actors? Where are they sending their funds to? How are they putting intermediaries in between? Because at the end of the day, I mean, no one likes ransomware except the bad guys. It's locking up hospitals, government agencies, companies, small businesses. You want to try to stop them at some point. So being able to identify those funds flow and where they're cashing out and try to eventually, you know, put some people effectively in jail to hopefully stop the problem. Why does that motivate you? Like, why are you motivated to help people? Is it the right thing to do? <laughs> it's the ethical thing to do, I think. Like, we do it for free, you know? I mean, well, it's not for free. We, it costs us money to do it, obviously, right? We don't take a cut from any of it. 
I just think it's the right thing to do. But also, doesn't that help build trust in the community that there's somewhere to go to? That it's not just a wild west, like somebody actually cares? And I mean, like if you, for example, had 10,000 US dollars worth of Ethereum stolen, whether you got fished out of a fake MetaMask uh, download that you got of Google or you know, whatever it is. Um, if you go to the FBI, they're not gonna care. If it's less than $5 million, you're not gonna get the FBI or the Secret Service to be able to do anything. They can't afford to put a person on it. You can submit it to a government website, that just gets added to statistics. So where are you gonna go? You can employ a lawyer, they'll cost you 600 bucks an hour for the first five hours, so where are you gonna go? So we think that having that facility where we're, I think, enabling the community to at least have trust in the system that somebody cares and connecting them up with students who care too and have the tools and the passion to do it is a valuable community service. At what point does FTX come into the conversation? Late 2018 is coming and it's becoming increasingly clear to us that the exchanges as they were at the time are complete disasters. Um, and particularly the derivatives exchanges are um, just not getting where they need to go. And then on top of that, there's just a lot of poor product decisions that compounded. And we basically felt like, look, we can build a better product than that. At this point, like it's, it no longer can be the case that they're just like secretly optimizing for things we don't understand. Like I'm sure they are, but like this has cost them too much. Like at this point, they're clearly just make like, you know, the way we'd build it would clearly just be better. Was it that you were doing what already existed better or you had a few niche outlier features that grew? It's not quite binary. There's a spectrum there. And it, there are some bigger decisions and just a large number of smaller ones put together that made it the same type of products, but just structured a bit differently. And in a lot of ways, trying to structure it in like the way that made sense to us. It's one of the few things where you can come up with a, a design change that makes a product both sleeker and also more powerful. For the general public that's utilizing crypto and utilizing uh, centralized exchanges, do you think they understand how much people like you or, or your peers care or take their deposited funds seriously or understand the responsibility that you feel to, to the customer? Do you think there's a mismatch there or they understand? Well, sometimes you, you of course, you get ang um, angry customers and uh, that, that's, that's pretty normal, right? But I believe that um, it's not clear to the public how we really care and how developers that are in the development team of exchanges really care uh, of, um, of people's money. You, you might be right there. Uh, I believe that uh, many do, many customers do, otherwise they would not deposit uh, uh, so many funds on exchange. But uh, you, sh you should see how, how much our developers, customer support and everyone in, in the company care about keeping their, the, 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 our customers' funds safe. So for, for our guys, it's not just a job, right? They, they feel that if they fail, if they, there is an issue, that is also even a simple issue in the platform. They, if they feel that they would let our customers down. So when I talk to my guys, I always tell them, look, you, you, have to, um, you have to code, you have to build something that is resistant to the wrath of God, right? You don't, you, you don't want to create something that the first sneeze will, uh, will make it everything fall, fall down. Because here's the thing, right? So if you give me one dollar or if you give me one billion dollars, it doesn't matter, right? I have, I have to have respect the highest respect for your money, because um, if I lose it, I will create an issue for you. I will damage your life. I will dam damage your family. So that's why everyone in our team is so passionate, and everyone in our team is to is so um, let me say aggressive with the code reviews, with uh, keeping the platform secure, and so on. Although I will say this upon reflection, I think it almost looks like the internet back in the 70s. The people who built the internet, a lot of them did it for free. Yeah, they might have had university jobs and things like that, but they built it because they were passionate about the vision of democratizing information and connectivity around the world. Tim Berners-Lee didn't build the 
World Wide Web because he was getting paid to do it. He built it because he believed passionately that this would change the world. And I think that the cryptocurrency community, the Bitcoin community is the same. They believe that it will change the world for the better. It will give individuals, you and me, my mom, the person in Venezuela who's like got their currency stuck, somebody in another country who's got massive currency inflation. It will give them ability to democratize and control their own money in a digital world. So there's so much going on in the cryptocurrency community of people who don't do it for the money. They do it because they passionately believe it's right for human freedom. And, you know, money is kind of speech at some point at the end of the day. So free speech is important. Freedom of idea is important. But money is important, too, because it's part of it. It's what makes these things happen. And so I think it's a wonderful community where you'll get a software programmer who works all day and then comes home and is tired and will sit down and write code on an Ethereum project, a Bitcoin project, or their own cool thing. And they do it for free because they believe it's good. Same way you get these students who you know, go to school all day and then come home and work on people's cases to try to recover their money. I, it's, I think it's a, an amazing community and it's helping everyone. It's helping the kids, it's helping grandma and grandpa, it's helping average investors, anybody who's ever had a problem, and it helps get people up into the community as well and you know, have sovereign control of their money. Does money make you happy? And can you describe in the most simple terms what your goal and mission is in the world? Yeah, and you know, obviously some amount of money does. No one likes to be starving. And so you know, the sort of trivial answer, trivial answer to that is like, I am happy that I'm not in absolute poverty. And it really sucks to be. Um, but, you know, the other piece of this, and sort of study after study has shown this, and I think it just is, is also sort of like intuitively seems pretty clearly at least mostly true, is that the, the sort of like amount that money makes you happier trails off pretty quickly, right? Like, at some point you're buying your second car, and then you're buying your third car, and you're kind of like, I don't even know why I need, to, but you just run out of things to spend money on that are clearly going to make your life better, right? And and that's just like true for, for most people. So I think that's sort of like, you know, one piece of this. Um, and it's certainly true for me. I'm not super materialistic. You know, I'm not really a big spender on myself. Um, but, you know, outside of that, um, you know, even if I were, it's sort of isn't what matters the most. There is a lot of ways that you can have impact on the world, um, and some ways that you can have quite a bit of impact on the world, and some ways that you can do quite a bit of good. And, and in the end, what I've sort of, you know, for a while been been thinking about the most and trying to optimize for is, how can I maximize the amount of good that, that I can do? You know, what does it look like if the goal isn't just do some amount of good, but figure out what I should do to be able to do the most good that I can. I think the people I, I can think of who've done the most good for the world are working or founding or really charging forward with organizations that are directly changing the world. And uh, you know, I may never be able to have the impact that, that some of them have had. We've seen Bitcoin weather quite a few storms in these early days and come out on the other side stronger than ever. In our next episode, we will try to solve Bitcoin's greatest mystery. Who is Satoshi Nakamoto? I'm Patrick McLean, and this is the Podcast Coins.